input system says you need to increase your impact factor, you need to increase, in, increase your Hirsch factor. How do you do that? You publish easy stuff in journals with high impact factor. You're not actually creating knowledge on, on <coughs> and you say, knowledge level. You're, you're creating an image of knowledge, you know, lots and lots of lots and lots of copies of all the same stuff that you send out to different journals so you increase your publications impact factor and this is how you how you actually manage to get up in the system yeah, and, and I think I just want to add something to this like in the in the earlier open science revolutions or evolutions science funding was never really affected they went like funding and incentivation went through the old channels and in this revolution, evolution, blockchain for science, um, for the first time funding will be affected and where the money flows, the honey is, right? Yeah. So, and if we, if we structure this in the right way, and we have seen the first ICOs for science projects, and they are like platforms that build tokens for ideas to like have continuous coin offerings for research projects, and if we like uh, attach like some, some rules to this that projects that, should, that are funded through ICOs in science should be blockchain open, then we can really change something this time. Yeah, and, and I, I really love that blockchain for science project because it's, at the end, if I'm a publisher, I'm providing a service. I organize the peer review process, I organize the archiving, I organize the publishing of your results, okay? Why do I have to be in such a central position? I'm just providing a service. And there can be LCB, there can be Springer, whatever can be, can provide the same service and the scientists should be able to say, okay, I go with them, I go with them. Yes, but you need to maintain the quality of the papers and for this you need an editorial board, peer review, you cannot publish everything in one journal. Because you need the peer reviewers, not the editors. The also main work is done by the peer reviewers. Yes, also the editors you need. They select the papers yep. that can go therefore to the reviewers. Mm -hmm. I know editing is, is important, but there are several projects that do this in the community for free. You don't need the publishers. There are several journals out there that do this. The community does it for the community. So I don't see it. But so just when you said about high quality, the issue is they're not high quality at all. That's, and people are publishing the same thing. I was back to that point before. Most people I know at universities don't want to do anything new because you know they, they're not doing stuff new. And it's just... People have this sort of mystical idea about what happens at universities. And <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Well, can, can, I, can I just say a quick thing about quality? I don't believe that we're able to assess quality correctly. <coughs> I think we're only able to assess a base level of quality. So are the methods sound? Is the mathematics sound of the statistical evaluation? Are the citations sound? And all the rest is just, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know what's going to be relevant in the future. And they just say, well, we don't understand this, so therefore it's not publishable. So if you do the same thing as everyone else, fine, you'll get published. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. okay. I uh, understand that you're a publisher. Um, uh, <coughs> what is your business model? How do you cover your costs? We, we have the open access business you model, see, so you have to pay. Are any okay. processing charges? Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to say? Yes, I think uh, two things um, when we discuss this whole topic. One is what are quality are we reviewing? Is it the technical quality of citations correct, etc., statistics correct, or, uh, but there is uh, selection by it happening uh, by the ones that you select to send to the reviewers, and it's uh, probably also a higher, it's, it's a qualitative selection uh, that happens. There is this bottleneck of qualitative or pseudo-qualitative selection. Um, and I, I'm not sure uh, how you would tackle that. And another general problem is um, wrong KPIs. And, and that is what uh, the whole scientific community is very much driven uh, because universities by being rated by the number of publications, so everybody is trying to like press publications out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a wrong KPI. I think that good researcher is not one with a lot of <coughs> publications, with some publications, but sometimes blue sky research uh, that doesn't end up in, like the, the best research happens where you cannot probably for a long time press a publication out of it. Um, how can we as a community um, 
tackle this, and that's probably very much beyond uh, a blockchain <coughs> question, but uh, we don't have good quality because people are driven by their wrong KPIs. Yeah, I, I believe as well, yes. And another question would be like IPFS is not yet production ready as far as I know. How would you like to store your data like now if I want to publish now? Actually I would like to propose that is a workshop for tomorrow. Okay? Because like it's also a big problem or a big thing for us, are we going to this IPFS dust? I don't know. So uh, as a publisher, you uh, suggested like there's a mega journal where we have all of the subjects in, uh, included, and that sort of speaks to the inter interdisciplinary nature of the science that we are in today. Um, so one of the uh, barriers I think to open science are also currently readability of articles, because uh, a lot of the times people put like a small like catchphrase probably their paper is, and most of the information goes into supplementary materials and so it's love for love for the most part it's really hard to read like if you're from another discipline what uh, somebody else is trying to do so how do you propose uh, to uh, bridge the gap between disciplines because if if somebody is really technical in their field they're really going to have a hard time trying to simplify their topics so do you suggest like a classroom version or how do you think that you can bridge the gap between these disciplines uh that's a very good question <laughs> I am not able to solve everything. So we are just providing a very small solution to the problem. So we're just providing a venue so you can publish it. I think that's very important what you're saying. I as a scientist need to strive to make my work understandable to other people. I know other people who think differently, who say I'm researching on a very deep level and I want to stay on that level, I want to concentrate on that level because that's what I'm good at. And if you don't understand it because you're not in the same level as me, it's not my problem. I don't <coughs> want to say that's wrong, I don't want to say that's right. I just would like to ask for like openness to accept these different ways how to work and try to make venues for everyone so that we can all work together. That's what I would say. Maybe there are different opinions out here. Maybe we want to do a workshop on that tomorrow. That's a very human thing. Yeah, I think. Different personalities drive those motivations. I was uh, at Wikipedia uh, Open Science Conference in Berlin, and I made a workshop about fun in open science. What's fun in open science? And, I, and one of the people said, and we all agree afterwards, that actually open science is a very human science, except like humans are, and do it the human way. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now we continue with Matthias. He will like, talk about the journal, the journal of crypto economics. Yes. Do the to us, yeah. And you can introduce that, like, what did you upload it? Is it Dropbox? Is it Dropbox? Yeah. Yes, hello. Welcome. Wait, this is the end of my slide. Yes. <coughs> yeah, um, hello, welcome. Um, I will talk today about the journal for crypto economics that uh, we are working on since approximately one year. And I will a little bit explain also the background of how uh, we came to this uh, journal and what, where we're we standing right now, what are the challenges we are facing. Um, so first of all, welcome and also a brief introduction to, to me. I'm a researcher and technology theorist uh, and I'm uh, having a background in computer science, architecture and a lot of interdisciplinary things. Um, I would consider myself a, a coder and um, also, um, I'm working in like diverse fields, so I'm especially interested in knowledge production and also in product cultures, so that's my background. But also, um, I'm director of Riot, the Institute for Future Crypto Economics. It's a small um, research institute in Vienna, and we're also part of the Austrian blockchain uh, cluster, so um, a few things that I will be presenting today are things also that we're bringing into this Austrian blockchain cluster context. So I'm also board member of the OSHWA, which is the Open Source Hardware Association in the US, um, which is basically some advocacy group to make sure that open hardware enters um, um, science 
but also um, um, that we can make uh, possibly um, um, hardware, um, um, make sure that hardware has the same principles as open source software, which is an entirely different process as open source software because you have to make a lot of different things available to scientific contexts. Uh, Jan was also in the past a project of numerous research projects, uh, mostly in Vienna. Um, so we developed one journal already, which is the Journal for Research Cultures, um, which we could actually design uh, together with the FWF, uh, through this open access uh, uh, grant that we got. Uh, in this context, also my colleague Andrew Newman, uh, who is here in the audience today, is one of the editors. Um, uh, if you're interested in, uh, um, maybe we can show you also um, a few examples on this. It was a re really, really interesting process for us as well, because we are looking uh, in the Journal for Research cultures much more and how actual knowledge gets produced in specific cultures and we tried to address this in the in the review process. So we um, were tackling uh, over the course of now four years uh, and, and testing different review processes and we were questioning um, um, first and foremost also, also as the um, um, speaker before was saying um, these specific review processes which are much more problematic in, in more close, uh, closed and more um, um, I would say embedded research fields where the researchers know each other. So like you cannot make sure, for example, that double-blind peer review is existing because the people would anyway know who is writing this text because some projects are so specific, so there's so many issues to tackle. Yeah, some other two projects I was working on was um, also coordinating the Axiom Open Hardware Cinema Camera, which was a large project in, uh, that we could uh, coordinate from Vienna, and also making a technology in F uh, we have science communication project with an open access publication. And a little bit about my background, how I came to Bitcoin. So um, I was together with two colleagues uh, developing the Bitcoin Cloud in 2010 and 2011, which was an, an art piece, uh, a large uh, mining rig that would only mine if you would watch it. So it was actually uh, criticizing the, the uh, attention economy and by that also extracting the, uh, itself as an, as an object out of the art market. So it had this kind of idea of um, um, how to utilize Bitcoin in a different way and how to work with, um, with attention. Uh, in, a, in a way, it created a small uh, microeconomy by itself. We were, in a, in a way, just using Bitcoin to make this point that um, um, we have a lot of like biased information also in the art world, or like like the, the bias is created through um, attributing um, 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 or like giving the context of the of the uh, of the art piece more of value as the actual art piece is worth in a way. So um, if you um, would actually exhibit in a museum, it would be like more relevant for you maybe as an artist than you would uh, if you would uh, exhibit in a small gallery. So um, I was then um, writing this uh, paper with my colleague uh, Ed Newman here, uh, which is called Cryptocurrencies and Distributed Community Experiments. We started in 2014 and then over, um, uh, over one year we're looking into specific um, cultures and research cultures and specific um, value propositions that were um, um, given uh, through the design of specific forked coins on the example of and we have to know at this, at this time there was no Ethereum at play and not existing right now. So uh, it was just starting. So um, there was no ERC20 token. So a lot of um, um, interesting uh, experimental um, designs and economic designs and uh, experiments have been undertaken by this altcoin community. So we were looking into this and by that actually creating a, a longer um, research which in the end uh, resulted in our <coughs> future, future crypto economies as we have it today. So a um, little bit actually also what I will be talking about now. I will briefly explain you actually how we are working uh, in the Institute of Future Crypto Economics and I will give a very brief introduction to crypto economics again because um, Sherman was already um, basically explaining all the, all the key values that you should uh, know and not feeling also, but um, I want to actually focus a little bit more on the, on, the, on the fringe aspects of it or the things that are not maybe yet uh, known, so the unknowns of crypto economics. And I will then explain um, uh, briefly about the channel of crypto economics and where we are standing with this. So um, Riot is uh, now located in Vienna. It's a space uh, which is approximately 300 square meters. We are there working um, like 12 developers, researchers. It's more of an, um, so, so we are actually focusing on applied research a lot. We have, um, uh, we also host a lot of meetups. We do um, small work groups, um, um, but also we develop um, with different uh, international institutions, specific um, um, research projects that are located around, uh, our, I would say, the domain of like, token economics, but also more in like, our privacy and transparency research. Um, uh, also, yeah, um, please make sure you sign up to our newsletter that we have like uh, weekly um, events also going on. There is also, um, for example, in 
July 26th, we will have a Monero meetup, which is um, featuring the Monero Open Hardware Wallet. So I'm very excited to, to finally see the production ready version. Um, so we're working also very closely, especially with informal research groups, so which are not necessarily in the institutions. It can be like hacker cultures or like people that, uh, that are working uh, around a specific code project or, or share some common belief in, in how, they, how they work. So in my opinion, it's also, also good to have like different um, um, institutions that also foster this kind of uh, research or make them invisible visible. So um, here's a um, small timeline actually of what, what we did. So um, uh, you see also the Bitcoin cloud. This is also uh, uh, this infographic is taken from the Blockchain Austria website, which is uh, which bundled a little bit the blockchain initiatives in the last year um, in Austria. And uh, we tried to little bit illustrate how the communities were um, um, emerging in Austria. So um, as we see, obviously there has been the, the um, um, specific hypes around 2013, 2014 uh, um, um, from Bitcoin and from cryptocurrency as such. But at the same time, we see also this is what we try to illustrate a little bit here that um, the groups or the culture or the culture platform is very informal. So there's a lot of meetups, like for example the Bitcoin uh, meetup, uh, there is uh, the Vienna meetup, one of the oldest ones. Then a uh, funny incident also that the Bitcoin uh, Foundation itself uh, was actually um, uh, founded in, the, in Vienna as well. Not so much, not so many people know that, but during uh, um, uh, Eden Schnitzel, the foundation was founded. There's all of these kind of hidden histories that we have in, in cryptocurrency and that we have in blockchain. And this is interesting also to, to um, um, uh, also the, the previous um, uh, speaker was uh, referring to this. Uh, we have a lot of um, non-institutional research, non-institutional um, uh, knowledge that is actually out there. Like, uh, the, the, this is a very cringe culture we, we can capture now, we can make it available. And I'm also happy that Sherman is now setting up this institute because we have to also make sure that this is actually happening in an institutional setting where researchers can, can benefit from this as well. So um, basically also give you sort of an idea what we are doing. So we have the uh, Archive for Crypto Economics, which is working with artifacts. So um, we are working in this field since approximately 2011, but not necessarily crypto economics, the term, since the term is a rather new term. We, uh, um, was actually first mentioned by Vlad Zamfi in 2014 in some, I guess it was some, some article on that or something. But then, um, of course, other people jumped on the bandwagon and were talking about it. And now, as Sherman was actually showing, we have a, a larger discipline emerging. So what we are doing, or what we did previously with Riot, is we were um, kind of collecting all these sorts of um, artifacts. Because um, with a strong design and art background that we had, we, that, that was the way how we worked and that, uh, how we actually were thinking about also like encapsulating this information and possibly displaying this kind of information in a science uh, um, communication context or in small exhibitions. So there's like one example of, a, of an art piece in our um, archive which is um, called uh, Blockchain Performance. It's actually 12 uh, um, of the sunflower seeds from uh, IYY um, which have been um, uh, purchased with the first um, Bitcoin results from the Bitcoin cloud in 2012. So um, I don't know if you're aware of the IYY Sandlaw seeds, but these are the, um, um, they are so important because IYY basically um, produced um, these kind of handmade um, Sandlaw seeds in the Tate Modern. Then the Tate Modern were, bu were buying a large amount of, of, of these um, Sandlaw seeds, so suddenly they had a value, an individual piece had a value. And on uh, um, eBay there, there was black market getting into existence about these sunflower seeds, so it was really interesting. So visitors would actually steal those sunflower seeds, and um, it was important for us to, to at this point, to, to point at this kind of dark uh, or like hidden economics so that, that we also um, have in existence in cryptocurrency. So another example are, um, is this uh, interesting piece it's called Step by Step, Artistic Boca and Vitalik Buterin 2014, which, is, uh, which are uh, Vitalik Buterin signature sneakers. It's more of a kind of funny take to this whole um, 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 idol culture that, we, that comes into existence in, uh, uh, in, in cryptocurrency, and especially around Vitalik Buterin, you know, these this, um, um, drawings of him like uh, holding the Ethereum uh, uh, logo. So it's actually another way of, um, for us to, to, to work with knowledge or to, to embed the knowledge to, to work with objects. So um, briefly also like to, to embed this now into the larger uh, topic about the Journal for Crypto Economics. And um, I know that uh, Sherman was actually saying a lot about these things already, but I will try to um, point to facts that are maybe not so clear or maybe uh, um, um, we're not uh, actually tackled yet. So um, there's this um, less known uh, quote from Satoshi Nakamoto who is um, actually 
uh, lying out or like explaining that um, he was working on Bitcoin's design for a very long time and there's a lot of speculation who he is. Some people claim to know who he is, some people even claim they are also talking about this, you can see on the Bitcoin Cash uh, debacle. Uh, we have, um, interestingly, um, um, the situation that of course a lot of things are solvable with, 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 with trust. Economics are based on trust. But the interesting thing that Bitcoin introduced was this idea of zero trust and to, in a way, create this kind of zero trust system. But at the same time, um, we have um, crypto economics which explains this. So although Nakamoto didn't know that, that the term yet and didn't use the term crypto economics, um, this is one of the more popular um, descriptions of what crypto economics is. Shannon was already uh, pointing to this. This is, um, if you Google it, you will have like, different uh, um, um, uh, kind of um, descriptions about it. But um, um, this is, for example, uh, Rad Stamp's Stamp take on it. So the, the focus on the design and characterization of protocols that govern the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services in a decentralized digital economy. Interestingly, um, these things could also be done without blockchain, because who says that blockchain is the only decentralized economy? And uh, we had a very interesting interview also um, with Lab where we were discussing this. So is there actually crypto economics outside of the blockchain? And it's, it could be like an interesting topic as well to, to, to look into. So um, as we heard already, before we have a cryptography plus economics and an interesting new um, mixture. And um, Satoshi Nakamoto presented the first crypto economic system. And this is usually the classic example on um, to explain this kind of in incentivization layer that Shannon was also pointing to. So we have um, BitTorrent as a very famous peer-to-peer -peer system. The basic problem is why would you share a file as soon as you have it, as you download the file? It's, uh, um, basically, you don't, don't have any incentive to, to stay online longer. So um, the other example that is also then used in this context is often Sia coin, which is trying to create this kind of incentivization layer by creating a decentralized marketplace, incentivizing and making sure that people keep files uh, uploaded, but at the same time having zero knowledge designed that you don't know which kind of data you're storing. So it's maybe like a little bit of uh, a lot of tech input, but I guess uh, like, uh, looking into the crowd, uh, most of you know already what I'm talking about. Um, these uh, are the three, also by uh, Sherman mentioned, fields that would be considered crypto economic research as of today. Uh, consensus protocols, crypto economic application designs, and state channels. But there's a lot of things that are outside of this scope. Also, um, I'm already tackled by Sherman. We have a lot, a lot of um, um, interesting aspects that have been tackled by outcomes in 2011, which were basically, and if you look at this, uh, um, I know it's a spinner from last uh, week's coin market cap. Uh, uh, market capitalization, a lot of um, um, altcoins, a lot of tokens, all these types of different, different uh, asset classes that are out there. But if we look at um, uh, um, the full scope, we see that um, actually before Ethereum was uh, invented, there's a, the, the, the value proposition was a different one because you had to basically make sure that um, you had um, a, a network, you had, to, you had to make sure that the network is alive. So basically if I would actually create a, a fork of Bitcoin, I would have to make sure that enough people uh, let's say at least more than two nodes have to be in existence, otherwise I'm, I'm risking uh, a Byzantine fault tolerance uh, not, not being at play, or like 51% attacks being actually 50%, so uh, it's, not, it's not that easy. So um, the interesting thing is like what we were looking at uh, at this uh, time in 2015, it was, was published also at, at the most uh, uh, problematic context because it's an Elsevier uh, uh, um, run uh, in publication, so it, was, it didn't get so much uh, uh, citations, so we should have put this uh, into open access, obviously. So we started to think also, like, uh, what the fuck is like, happening with academic publishing? So um, what um, in the end happened also at this time was Ethereum uh, actually got introduced, which changed the, the complete way of how um, um, basically crypto economics as such came into existence, but at the same time we had um, um, a very important uh, um, situation happening with the data, namely the ERC-20 token standard standardization uh, coming up. And, uh, here's a, uh, I'm, I'm linking here to a, an article by my colleague Daniel Pitler who was writing on the, on the Condor blog about the introduction of tokens and what it did to the ecosystem. So interestingly, we are facing this, this new um, asset class uh, or, or time of uh, different asset classes and Ethereum changed very, very much how actually people would actually think about tokens. So the, te the technical or the, the um, um, technical uh, um, 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 knowledge of the people thinking about uh, um, um, assets, thinking about digital assets, um, uh, that wasn't no precondition anymore. So basically you shouldn't, or you wouldn't need to, to know so much about like systems design, you would just need to, to use software. So it's an integral part that Ethereum uh, introduced. 
At the same time, uh, um, through this introduction of Ethereum, we had a lot of other experiments, uh, social experiments, different experiments coming into existence, which were not only um, based around currency. Also, uh, as Xiaomin was outlining all these kind of different um, um, domains, what is, uh, what is all like reached out, branched out, um, work like governance uh, protocols, we, had, we saw like prediction markets, all these different fields that are, there's not so much research into them yet. There's maybe like the small parts and small elements from, from uh, earlier cultures, but now actually this kind of arms race, also because you could actually make money through ICOs, started. So this is the, this is the, the, the time we are in now. And um, what, how we see it as, uh, uh, currently is um, um, crypto economics in, a, in its core design produces or, uh, actually projections of future events because you have to make sure that um, the, the user in the end in your system, the, the player, um, works and, and, and functions in a way uh, um, that you expect them to work. So basically you have to make sure that there's a punishment for um, specific um, um, unwanted behavior, but there's also a small incentive to, to, to behave correctly. So uh, this would be like, of course, the, the way how we would design a crypto economic system. But um, there's other ways of predicting the future, and there's other uh, systems and other specifics we can actually look at. And this is what we are looking at with the, with the Journal of uh, Crypto Economics. And um, for us specifically, we're tackling this through the problems. So we, um, we accept, and we have to accept, and it's, it's actually also nice to some extent, um, that crypto economics is such a very narrow field. But we were thinking about, okay, what other kind of fields can we look at that maybe did undergo a similar transition? So um, it's interesting to, in this context, to always point to game theory, which was a very narrow field in, in its initial uh, setup in the, in the beginning, but then later emerged to an interdisciplinary field also with um, elements of uh, social sciences and all um, sorts of interdisciplinary theory put on top, uh, which is interesting. And now we have this kind of um, uh, large interdisciplinary field uh, at play. So we are asking ourselves, like, how can we make that field more interdisciplinary by not looking only at the, at the mechanic designs, but also to, to, to question what are, like, for example, social implications of specific future events or future systems that are designed and how are they interacting? What kind of, what kind of um, maybe society are um, specific um, um, over-incentivized um, systems or like economic systems producing? And um, especially we're also thinking um, about crypto economics beyond Ethereum and outside of the blockchain. Is this actually possible? Is this happening? Uh, is it just like an, an utopian or dystopian idea, like a, like a possible approach to question what could be this kind of larger field of crypto economics? So um, currently our challenges, and it's very interesting also to see that there was so much, uh, so many different other projects now, um, always like pointing at this, uh, uh, this, this fact that academic publishing is flawed and that we have so many uh, issues in the specific process. Um, we are currently in the phase of, of searching for reviewers and um, to get a non-opinionated board setup, which is uh, very important because um, the problem is um, um, the industry, like most of the people are working in the industry. So how can you make sure that, that, that you don't have a board with like 20 Ethereum uh, um, uh, biased uh, people? On the, it's like the, the question, how, how would you set this up? So we are, uh, um, since half a year, like setting up a board and making sure that, that there's a, a non-bias happening. And especially if the reviews is interesting and is, is important because um, I don't believe that um, if you would, for example, create a token mechanics paper and would actually give this up for, um, for, for review that there's any unbiased um, um, result possible. It's like, it's especially the people working in ICO culture or like a head where we're uh, working with ICO policy before know that um, um, it's just costing a specific amount of money to get the specific result you want with, with any sort of uh, um, uh, member uh, amount of the communities. It's like, it's just, ha it's happening. We see this on a daily basis actually, but, uh, but uh, um, um, paid uh, um, kind of uh, PR campaigns that we see on Reddit and other uh, of this media. So um, here you see like a, um, um, just the, the basic um, thing that we outlined for Ethereum DevCon uh, last year in Cancun, and we were spreading this and starting a different process of coming to the result of our journal. So what we did um, is we were um, basically thinking about how can we, um, first of all, frame the field, how we can actually understand what kind of different um, um, beliefs are there, what kind of different players are there, who is like, working in crypto economics, what kind of different um, um, taxonomies do we have to create in order to make sure that we have this, this uh, a good starting point. So um, what we did in the end uh, is we created the laboratory for future crypto economics, which is also now located in, our, uh, in, the, in the riot space. <coughs> we also a mobile setting where we can do interviews, where we can make uh, uh, photos, and we are creating 
qualitative interviews, basically. So what we um, call it actually is um, we call it the qualitative interviews continuous integration method. So what we try to uh, um, wrap it up, like you, oh, you yeah. a little bit. Okay, thank you. To wrap it up. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just like two more minutes. Okay. Yeah, okay? So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. basically, um, um, how we're working is we're trying to create and make it more of a social process. Also, so we. Um, have the, these three editors currently working on it. Jaya Breke also she will be joining us in, in Vienna and will be also working in the context of the Austrian Blockchain Center, which is also Liri uh, and me. And uh, we are basically um, setting up these in these three, working in these three formats. So the laboratory, which is this interview setting, qualitative interview settings, we have now until now 22 interviews that will be published uh, um, within the next month. We have the residence of future crypto economics, which, which brings like 12 crypto economics researchers to Vienna, where we're creating this kind of um, um, uh, longer, like participatory research um, um, starting from next year. And the journal for crypto economics, which is, will be put in the output uh, um, format. So basically, um, this is how we see it. So that it's um, the lab and the residency producing this kind of core of the journal. And, um, Basically, um, the status is like we started, started at the end of three. Also, the process we are we have 22 interviews so far, and we had a close call out since February 2018, which is basically um, seeing also what kind of um, research we can get from from specific researchers we directly ask for so more of a positive outreach. And there will be an open call we're working on, which will go out uh, quarter three of 2018. And we plan a rolled a rolling publication, so there will be already a few um, reviewed uh, papers out, hopefully also by. 2018. So um, our current uh, <laughs> challenges and questions, and um, um, also like if um, because there's a lot of um, possibly interested audience also here, we're extending the board, so we're very happy um, if you have suggestions for board members. We're collecting reviewers, so if you're feeling safe in a specific crypto economic context or specific expertise, then please get in contact with us. And of course, we are we are uh, going public soon, mm -hmm. also with the call. But um, yeah, with us, it's not not long. So yeah, contact us if, you have, uh, if you're interested to participate or to, to also get uh, started. My colleague um, Andrew Newman is also here. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we are running a little bit short in time. Uh, we should definitely, I think the first thing to do is to map the research questions. So I think there is a lot of uh, ways to collaborate here. And um, we will have a break. We're running very, very late. So if you have questions, Matthias uh, will not be here later in the afternoon, but he will still be here in the, in the, in the, um, uh, or do you have I'm to run now? I have to, I'm like okay, in uh, 40 minutes something. Okay, so anyhow, we're having a, sorry for that, a just 10 minute break. Uh, we have uh, seven more talks coming up. No, 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 we do that changes, okay? Uh, okay. So there, there will not be a community discussion yeah. about like what blockchain we will use. We okay. can do that tomorrow. It would be by flood, uh, led by flood. And Lori is not coming. Maybe he will come tomorrow about the Michael contribution talk. So we have like six more talks. And um, you already know the audience. You already know what we've talked about. And uh, maybe you can just like drop some slides and still drop them and stick with like 10 minutes plus like two, three minutes question yes, and answer. It's always okay? the same problem. Uh, so it evolves, it evolves. We get to know each other right. and yes. yeah, okay. So <laughs> uh, thank you, Matthias. Please stick here for a few questions. We'll have a 10 minutes break. There are drinks outside. There is a small machine if you want some sweet uh, or there's some snack, a snack machine and we'll have a proper lunch break. Yeah, and we, we'll lunch. continue at 11.30, okay? At 11.30. Yeah, okay. perfect. Ja, Sönke. Sönke, ja. Ja, Sönke, ja. Sehr schön. Gut, super. Okay.